So I wanted to just offer uh, a few final thoughts about the uh, series of exchanges that uh, David Long and I had, um, including a two-hour debate that Breeze Alderman hosted. Um, so I had to um, leave David Long's uh, Facebook page because I couldn't really... I just lost my patience with the continuous um, character assault felt like to me I, I feel like that's the fairest way to describe it um, or ad, just ad hominem attacks and um, you know it's one thing to argue against the validity of a position and indeed you know David keeps asking me for reasons for evidence for logic but he doesn't really have much of that himself uh, most of what he um, has been throwing out at me in response to my criticisms of him and of my own arguments in favor of my position. Most of what I've been receiving from him are like diagnoses of the biases that are motivating my claims and really not much in the way of dealing with the claims themselves and offering really not nothing at all from David about uh, his own position and how he might logically justify it. No answer to the questions that I asked him in our debate. So, you know, I just I just gave up, and I feel bad about that. And, you know, I might even be open to another dialogue at some point, but I just can't get in there and his Facebook page. And um, I just felt like I I didn't have the patience and I, the time really to adequately address and just rebut some of the misconceptions because anyone that reads what he writes and doesn't actually watch our exchanges, I think would be left with a um, very distorted picture of, of what's going on here. So, um, you know, I think initially I was hoping for a dialogue and this turned into a debate and it turned into a refusal on, on David's part to consider the framework that I'm offering just a refusal to even engage with it and instead to um, remain in his framework and attack me from you know within his castle walls I kind of feel like I showed up at the door of his integral 2.0 castle and I kind of knocked and I was like hey idealism it's not so bad it's not really my position that's this thing over here evolutionary panpsychism I think it's consonant with all the science but idealism's not so bad you know and you know David was nice enough to let me in and you know he made me leave um most of my weapons at the door of course meaning you know he didn't want me to like name drop or refer to these uh, these these um ideas grounded in the history of philosophy but that I, he didn't want me to assume that anyone had read any of that and i needed to like on the spot provide all the evidence and logical justification for every claim that i make um you know just extemporaneously as if from pure, like, um, the, the space of pure reasons and without drawing on any sort of authority, which David didn't even pretend to approach that. You know, I was cross-examined in our debate about my position. David didn't even present his position. I mean, he told us what it was and said a lot of scientists seem to like it, but uh, he didn't describe really what it is. He didn't defend it from my critiques he didn't respond to my questions about his particular view of what emergence is even saying there's different kinds of emergence you know i referred to uh it's weak and strong or so soft and hard emergence um you know there are other ways to parse it but the point would be that the scientists who talk about emergence are, are meaning something different they could mean some kind of epiphenomenalism the emergence of sort of a qualitative phenomenal space that has no effect on the, the the body of the organism that it is secreted from or, or projected out of so it's kind of just a ghost in the machine other uh, emergentists would imagine that the the life or the consciousness that emerges is that we need to think of this more in a dualistic way because it actually does have a causal influence on the body to which it belongs and so you have a a, a whole that has emerged from parts that then exerts an influence, an intelligent influence, back down upon the parts that are producing it. And that, to me, implies at least a polarity, if not a dualism. And I, I'm offering these as two options for the emergentist. 
in a framework that's materialist, basically, because that's the, the that's the framework that David is putting forward. But this is really what's happening between he and I is a clash of frameworks, right? I was invited into his castle, his framework, and I tried to ask him questions about his materialist view. I don't mean materialism in a pejorative way, I just mean he thinks consciousness comes out of these parts, particles. It emerges. He doesn't even think there's really free will in the sense that the consciousness that emerges could really have an actual effect on the course uh, of events, right? He didn't think that's possible. So anyways, I'm trying to speak in terms of his framework. I'm adopting the language that is spoken within his castle of Integral 2.0, but I didn't get a, a response from him. So then, you know, I tried to step back onto my horse and, you know, maybe I was pointing to my castle and it's like beyond the mountains over there that way. It's called evolutionary panpsychism. And uh, here are my reasons. And David was like, oh, you're making assumptions. Here, These are the rules in my castle. Like we, we agree to be um, materialist and to not make any assumptions or uh, to just be um, reasonable. Uh, according to his set of, of rules. And, and I was like, well, okay, but consider that um, in my framework, uh, we can't just dismiss I idealists or even religious people because maybe there's some sort of a God instinct that is an innate part of our very biological existence and indeed our consciousness. And that, um, you know, that God instinct wasn't something that we just like it's not like humans invented it. it it we're born with it and it's part of what made our species intelligent in the first place and 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 motivated us to become civilized as we call it um gandhi said it would it's a great idea this civilization that westerners uh post-enlightenment people are always talking i mean you know the romans were talking about it too and, and the greeks of course but for thousands of years, the, the West has been talking about this idea of civilization because of this God instinct in us is what I'm suggesting. And this God instinct is a, it's an intuition of intelligibility at the base of being. It's an, it's an intuition of um, a truth that transcends us as finite particular beings, but that we can strive to know. I mean, the very basis culturally of science and empiricism and rationalism it's it's these methods these values are rooted in a particular um religious cultural context and you can't really understand what scientific rationality is outside of that context and so we have to know history we have to understand history and how science emerged what are the motivations underlying it and i value science you know, I value the religious cultural milieu out of which it emerged as well, because I think there's a tendency, it's a reactionary tendency, it's kind of adolescent, really, um, where people become rationalistic atheists and they reject against religious dogma. And so there's this reactionary movement that's responding to something, I think, people that really hold the, the, that position. There are fundamentalist, dogmatist, religious believers, and they're dangerous because they're trying to impose their views um, about women and about the environment and about non-white people uh, and about um, sexuality. You know, there's a certain dogmatic point of view that's trying to gain control of the state so as to wield power against those it deems uh unworthy of of their god's love and and that's problematic and i'm on david's team against those people because that is a derangement of thought i don't think that's actually religious in a healthy sense at all it's a form of dogmatism that transcends just religious communities um, we find this dogmatism in all sorts of communities including the reactionary rationalistic atheists um, so we need to avoid dogmatism in religion and we need to avoid dogmatism in science and when I say that I'm not attacking science science is an absolutely essential method of inquiry science is not a belief system it's a method of inquiry 
And the thing is, religious traditions um, are not belief systems either. Actually, I think in their authentic sense, they are um, methods of transformation. Science is a method for um, collecting information and interpreting it. Religion is a method for um, collecting souls and transforming them, right? And these aren't like two totally separate processes, right? You need to have been, a, I think, a transformed soul to do really the best science. And I'm not saying that every scientist has to be religious. It's just that the very notion of scientific truth that the scientist says they are searching for is, is religious in, in structure. I mean, to posit something like a scientific truth in nature that exists objectively independent of your finite mind, I mean, you have faith in the order of the universe. You didn't discover that order first, right? Because indeed, there's plenty of chaos out there too, but you have a faith that there is order to be found. And so only out of that faith can the scientific pursuit of knowledge and truth in nature even be um, inaugurated. So I don't think these things need to be in conflict. Uh, I also you know, want to say that, um, again, just to reiterate, I'm open to further dialogue about this eventually, but it, it has to be based on a willingness for like, you know, David maybe, or anyone else who wants to argue for an emergentist perspective to like accept my invitation and actually come into to my castle, or maybe it's just a hut, I don't know, but just come on in and let me, let me tell you about my framework and introduce you to the the words that I use to make sense of reality, right? David's always worried <clears throat> that um, I'm just spouting poetry. And, you know, thank you, David. He's always saying it's great poetry. I appreciate that. I take that compliment seriously. I I strive to, to, to you know, partake in the, um, you know, bringing forth of good poetry. But, uh, you know, that's David kind of being dismissive at the end of the day also. And I don't thank him for that because I think what he's missing is that, and he even kind of admitted this, didn't he, in our debate, science itself is rooted in these, in the poetic basis of mind. There's metaphor uh, at the core of every scientific theory and even each mathematical equation has that equal sign in it, right, that mimics the role of the is in a metaphor. So... We can't escape poetry, um, and we we are poetic in in our religious modes, and we are poetic in our scientific modes, and in different ways. Science is a different kind of poetry than religion, no doubt about that. God is not a scientific hypothesis. I would say God is rather the ground, the possibility, the condition for the possibility of something like scientific hypothesis, something like an intellect capable uh, of seeking intelligibility in the world via experiment, via, via the hypothetical deductive method. Like, how is that even possible? When we start having that conversation about the grounds of possibility, that's when God comes in. But God doesn't come in once we've already accepted that science is possible because it's grounded in some, in, in the intelligibility of being, once we've accepted that, then we do science and we, we do, you know, chemistry and we do molecular biology and we do cognitive science and we figure shit out. And that's a beautiful process. And I study that stuff deeply because, as White had put it, science is not a fairy tale, but it's rather the story of the universe. And I want to know that story because I'm a part of that universe. And I want to be able to participate as fully as I can in what is actually going on here. And so, when I talk about emergence, right, I think in this debate with David, people might get the wrong idea that I'm dismissing emergence as such, and that's not the case at all. Um, the, you know, complex systems theory's understanding of uh, nature as a, a bunch of nested hierarchies of organization, and that, that there are these these moments of emergence when higher order modes of self-organization, uh, you know, arise where, you know, 
parts following relatively simple rules under the right conditions can can give rise to very complex wholes and um, this way of understanding nature is is beautiful and essential uh, and helps us make sense of evolution as not just a gradual plotting completely blind um, process where it's just an environment selecting based on a death algorithm um, and deciding what organisms survive and what forms proliferate a complex systems theory understanding of emergence allows us to see how no as Stuart Kaufman puts it there's order for free in nature holes emerge out of simpler parts all at once in order to um, accomplish uh, a difficult task more effectively and so if nature is full of the emergence of complex holes then we can't understand it in a reductionistic way the parts also are themselves holes uh, at every scale of nature we're talking about self-organizing processes giving rise to new um, thresholds of, of order right that that uh, that that emerge and uh, are auto poetic or self-producing they maintain themselves and then you know um, there's these nested holons as as Wilbur drawing on Arthur Kersler's work describes it so that's what nature is when we describe it from the outside. It's a complex system of these emergent holdons, and um, I think that's a that's right. You know, that's about as good as we can do understanding nature scientifically right now. My only argument against David's emergentism is that we can is that that process of of self organization and emergence of holes out of parts that it tells us anything about the origins of consciousness. There's an analogy here in biology where we think that Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection is an explanation of life, when that's not what it is at all. Darwin didn't even claim to be ex explaining that. Darwin was offering a theory of speciation, right? Um, not an or a theory of the origin of life. Just read the last paragraph of Origin of Species and, and, and you'll see what I mean. Um, where he references the creator that breathed life into a first form or a first couple of forms of life. And then from there, there forward, with that one free miracle, his theory of natural selection can explain speciation. So in other words, Darwin assumes self-organizing and reproducing organisms for his theory, theory of natural selection to get off the ground. In a similar way, an understanding of cosmic evolution in terms of the emergence of more complex holes in this nested hierarchy or holarchy, um, I think that assumes experience. It does not explain it, right? It, assume, it, it, it assumes a, yeah, a yearning that energy itself is not just entropic. If it was, we wouldn't be here, right? The quantum vacuum is apparently full of energy it's it's a, this it's this plenum of potential energy and it exists at every point in space apparently and i'm just i'm just repeating to you what the quantum physicists are saying and you know how does something come out of that potential how how does potential energy come into actual existence in space-time right as kinetic energy how, how does this transition take place uh, you know the principle of sufficient reason demands of us that we that we seek a cause for this and uh randomness doesn't really it seems like the exact opposite of what we're looking for it's not a reason it's not a scientific reason it doesn't mean what does this mean then? Do we need to then turn to religious revelation instead of scientific reason to understand how it all began? I don't think we need to do that, really. I think we need to talk in terms of God as some kind of ultimate principle or source of order, and there's nothing wrong with that because science presupposes order and causality. So therefore, science was going to ask the question, what's the source of order? And I think traditionally the word God has been used, and we can keep using it doesn't make us dogmatic religious believers. 
if this notion is at the base of logic and justification and science, as all of the geniuses from Gödel to Einstein to Newton will tell you. So I'm all for emergence, but it doesn't tell us where experience comes from. It doesn't tell us where aim comes from. And, you know, David would say, well, aim and experience are just emergent at the level of Maybe David would say cells, living cells. Some other people would say emergence at the level of human consciousness. But it has no effect on anything. It's just an epiphenomenal illusion, right? I don't think that's true. I think consciousness, human free will, um, all of our values and, and ideals, I think they are just as much a part of reality as anything else. And the challenge to the metaphysician and the philosopher and the natural philosophers to figure out how consciousness is part of the actual world as we experience it. Consciousness as we experience it, as if it actually has some effect on what happens, as if it's a real participant here in the way things happen and become, and not just a passive observer or a ghost in the machine. The challenge for me as a philosopher is to explain how that's possible in the universe that we observe in the universe that we remember. Um, and so that's why I'm drawn to evolutionary panpsychism. I don't know, is there anything else that I want to say? I think that's probably enough. So um, yeah, take that for what it's worth. I hope that helps clarify where I'm coming from. And um, yeah, uh, the Dialogos continues, right?